night had fallen As he hung his head Pierced and beaten He gave his final breath The earth was shaken As the fell was torn There was no other To pay the price you paid Jesus glorified Higher than the heavens Forever he is risen And Jesus praised his name To a thousand generations Forever he is king Oh, we praise the name of Jesus
incredible time of worship with our church family this morning. If you're a first time guest with us, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Whether you're tuning in from home, from afar, or in our family lounge, we want to get to know you more. So if you're with us in person, feel free to stop by our connection station in the lobby and say hi at the end of service. If you're tuning in from online, you'll be able to find our connect card over on the website or our app. So pop over, fill out the card, let us know more about you. If you haven't heard, we are back together in person. Every Sunday we have service at 9.30 at Regal Kingstown and we are so excited to have our church family back together. So if you wanna join us next week, hop on over to the website and save your seat. Now's the time in our service where we transition to the giving of our tithes and our offerings. When you put God first in every area of your life, you allow Him to just reap through you so many blessings for others. Our church is able to give through outreach, both near and far, care for our members, and even the services every week because of your giving. Let us pray over this offering this morning. Father God, I just thank you so much for the the blessings that you are going to come and bring to our church family. Father, I just thank you so much that we're able to touch the community around us and those that are here right beside us. I pray that you open our eyes to see those in need so that we can step into the calling that you have for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church family, now's the time to get ready for the message. So grab your notebook, get ready for an incredible word this morning from Pastor Keith. 
Hey church family, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so, so glad that you are here with us today. You could probably see by the extra measure of excitement that I am so, so pumped for today. Why? Because today is such a pivotal day for our church. It's the day that we are moving forward as a family. And I know that you are joining us at home online. I wanna let you guys know that we are so grateful that we are gathering, but we are still here for our online community. Because here's what I'm aware of. I'm aware of that in, in moments like this, for all that we have endured, and I'm talking about all that we have endured, I believe that, that the enemy had a plan. I'm a firm believer that the enemy had a strategy. I'm a firm believer that the enemy had zeroed in on our church community and his desire was to make sure that we never came to this day. But I'm so grateful that God got involved. I'm so grateful that God stepped to the plate and made sure that he shut down anything that the adversary was trying to do. I'm not sure if any of us have ever had a but God moment. A moment where you knew that it was out of your hands, a moment when you knew it was out of your strength, that the evidence all on itself was seem to suggest that there's no chance of survival, but God. I can think of several moments in scripture, but God. I think about the children of Israel as they were about to go across the Red Sea and they had no clear vision forward, but the enemy was coming behind them, but God. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how they were in the fiery furnace and it seems as if they should have been destroyed, but God. In fact, Anthony, it says that when they came out of it, the sin of smoke wasn't even on them. I truly believe that when we are done in this season, that we are not going to look like what we've been through. I'm so grateful that God has preserved us. Today, we are celebrating the fact that we are all moving forward. It's a new season, but it's the same God. We're, we're in a new venue, but it's the same God. And I celebrate the fact that God has preserved us and been with us every step of the way. I'm so grateful for our online community. I'm so grateful for our community that's gathering. And I pray that as God is moving us forward, that God stirs your heart, that you know that you have a place at home with us. If you have your Bibles, I wanna invite you to, to join me in the book of Nehemiah chapter six. The book of Nehemiah chapter six. There's a lot of context um, that I would like to provide for this passage. And so I'll, I'll hit on some of that as we're moving through um, the message. So even though I'm gonna jump right into this passage, um, for those who are unfamiliar with it, don't worry, I will make sure that you understand um, how we got to where we are and where I believe God is leading us through the lens of this passage. So starting at verse number 15, Nehemiah chapter six, verse number 15, it says this, that the wall was completed in 52 days. And on the 50th day of the month of Elul, um, when all the enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. When the enemy who had a strategy to keep the man of God from accomplishing his mission, when they saw that God was with them and that they moved forward, they lost their confidence. They were concerned because they knew it wasn't man that did this. It wasn't man that was able to preserve it, but it was accomplished by God. Now jumping over to Nehemiah chapter 7. And we're going to look at a few verses there. It says this. Now, when the ball wall had been rebuilt and I had the doors installed, the gatekeepers, the singers and Levites were appointed. Then I put my brother Hananiah in charge of Jerusalem, along with Hananiah, commander of the fortress, because he was faithful man who feared God more than most. I said to them, do not open the gates of Jerusalem until the sun is hot and let the doors be shut and securely fastened while the guards are on duty. Station citizens of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some at their homes. Verse number four, the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it and no houses had been built yet. Then God put into my mind to assemble the nobles, the officials and the people to be registered by genealogy. I found the genealogical record of those who first came back and I found the following written in it. Our final verse here at number six, there are the people of the province who went up among the captive exiles deported by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Each of them returned to Jerusalem and Judah to his own town. Each of them had returned to their own town. Let me give us a little bit of background really quick before we jump into this message. The, the people of God had been scattered for many years now. The people of God have been scattered for, for many years. In fact, it's been about 70 years in this. And, and Nehemiah was compelled to do something about it. He heard about how Jerusalem 
had been desolate. He had learned about how the temple had been destroyed. And when he got this information, the Bible said that, that it moved him to tears, that he was broken down because he understood that as long as Jerusalem didn't have its walls, as long as the temple wasn't there, there was no safety, there was vulnerability, there was brokenness. And so it compelled him to do something about it. I'm a firm believer that when something stirs your heart, it should activate your hands. That, that when something is really on your heart, it should, it should compel you to do something with your hands. So after 52 days, this wall was completed, this wall that, that represented safety. Now it was time for the people of God to come home. The people who had moved away, the people who didn't come back because there was no wall, they felt vulnerable, they felt broken, they didn't want to come back. But now the things were in place that allowed them to come back home. That's what I want to talk to us about for the next few moments on this idea of coming home. And I've simply entitled today's message, Welcome Home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for moments like this when we have the ability to gather in your name. I pray that you speak to us. I pray that you inspire us. Lord, I pray that you challenge us. And I ask that you give us open eyes that we can see you. I pray that you give us open ears that we can hear you, God. And I pray for open hearts that we can receive everything that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. You know, in all the years that I have um, been doing ministry, there's a lot of highlights and things that categorically I would define as being my favorite. What, one of the things that I think that rises to the top of the list is, is whenever I have an opportunity to be a part of someone's marriage journey. It's, it's one of my favorite things in the world. I, I love when I, I have an opportunity to sit down with a couple going through the premarital process. I, I love when I get a chance to officiate weddings because it's like you get a chance to sit on the front row of someone's journey. You get a chance to kind of just listen to all the variables, their upbringing, the different things that they've encountered, and then ultimately how the two paths collided that now has them at a point where we're sitting down having a discussion about what their lives together is going to look like. It's one of my favorite things. Things, man. I really, really enjoy hearing about it. And, and what I love to do is I, I love to provide a little bit of perspective. I, I love to provide a little bit of counsel, a little bit of wisdom on that, because I know for me, when I got married, I didn't have any of that. You know what, my, you know what the standard was? When I, you know what premarital counseling looked like for us? It was, you love each other? Yes. You love Jesus? Yes. Go in peace. You guys are good to be married. Like, that, was, that was the extent of what marriage counseling, uh, premarital counseling looked like for us. So you, you know what happened? That meant that when Megan and I tied the knot and we got married, and granted, we had been together for five years, so we were very, we were professionals at arguing. Like we had a, we had a PhD at the level of arguing. Like we had a grace for it. But then when we got radically saved and started moving in the direction of the things of God, I thought those things were in the past. And I'm like, man, we're saved. We're, we're fired up. We're spirit filled, man. We're never gonna have an argument again. Boy, was I wrong. Like we, we would have some knockdown drag outs. And I, I did the thing that, that no husband should do. Man, I would, I would Bible juke her all day. She would say something slick to me and I'd be like, you know, you, the Bible does say that, you know, wives should honor their husbands. Um, I, I, would, I would say these little random things at her and, and I was surprised that it didn't stick. Like she had some other things that, I would, that she would say to me that were not in scripture. I'll just put it to you that way. But, but, but I had to learn the hard way. So because we learned the hard way and then we began to understand the, the nuances and the process of the two becoming one, it, it began to help us to understand the work that was necessary. So, so when I sit with couples, I love to talk to them to help them to understand that you will face opposition. That, that you will face opposition, you will face challenges, that, that process of two individuals who are unique and distinct, who are not supposed to sacrifice those things, but find a way to bring those things together for a total wholeness, that's a process. That's surgical and it's a, it's a lifelong journey. So I love when I get a chance to sit down with a couple and walk them through this thing because here's the reality of it. A lot of times when we face opposition, we get a little afraid. When we face opposition, we believe that that, that somehow is a, is a reflection that, that God is no longer with us. We, we realize that we begin to feel that, that maybe, maybe the reason why we're facing this opposition, maybe the reason we're facing these challenges is because, it's because God is not in it. We all probably know what that feels like in some way or another. I, I'm not typically the type of person that believes that everything is the devil's fault. I do believe that we have to just make sure that we take responsibility and do a better job. But what I will say to you is this, I believe that the enemy is lurking and looking for opportunities to exploit our humanity. 
I believe that he's lurking and looking for opportunities to exploit our humanity. So if there's any gaps, if there's any vulnerabilities, he's waiting to pounce. This is why scripture says that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When, when God is speaking to Cain and Abel, he says, like, man, like you, you understand that, that the enemy is crouching at your door, that sin is crouching at your door. Make sure you, make sure you watch out for it because you don't want to stumble into it. I believe the enemy is always looking for opportunities to exploit our humanity. And, 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 I, and I have to ask myself why. Because sometimes when I, when I really begin to sense what, what people who really face immense amount of opposition, I, I often ask myself why? What, why? And, and as I look in scripture, I have found over and over again, I have yet to see a single individual who was truly doing something for the kingdom that did not face extreme opposition. I, I, have, I have yet to find a single incident of a person who was really, really doing something that God had called them to do, and they were not facing resistance or opposition. I, I am truly of the mindset that the adversary strategy is to try to give us so much resistance until we just want to give up. And in fact, one of the patterns that I recently found is that the adversary loves to snuff us out in infancy so we never grow to be what God is really calling us to do. I've I seen this with Moses. You know that Moses was the called out one. Moses was the one who was going to literally lead over a million people in bondage to a place of deliverance. But the adversary tried to kill him while he was an infant. Think about that. The enemy wanted to kill him while he was an infant so that he couldn't grow to accomplish the thing that God had for his life. We even can look at Jesus. Jesus, the one who died on the cross, who made salvation available to everyone, to whosoever. But the enemy tried to kill him while he was two. I'm beginning to recognize this pattern here, that when God has such a strong purpose and an anointing and a calling on something, that the enemy tries to attack it while it's young and vulnerable so that it doesn't have the depth to endure the attacks and that it doesn't have the maturity to go on to accomplish what God is calling it to do. Think about the early church. After Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes, they're empowered, and immediately the church is attacked. It's not even a year old. The church is facing just vivid attacks. The churches, the people are scattered, but yet God still managed to use it. I, I believe that the adversary recognizes that if I can keep you from believing in yourself, that if I can keep you from truly grabbing a hold of what it is that God wants to do in you, that you will give up in infancy and you will not grow to accomplish the thing that God is calling you to do. See, when I look at the people of God, I see that they have consistently had their fair share of challenges. We can even look at Adam and Eve. From the moment that God created them and gave them their purpose of being fruitful and multiply, the adversary shows up. We can even look at their family dynamic. When they had their first two sons, the adversary shows up. We can go a little bit further and look at Noah, who saved all of humanity, but got off and got drunk. The adversary shows up. The enemy is always lurking, trying to cause confusion and to try to prevent the people of God from accomplishing the thing that they're called to do. We can even look at Abraham fighting with him and causing him to, to step outside of his marriage. The enemy is always very present, and we can follow that line all the way up until we find ourselves here in this text. The people of God have been in exile for 70 years. In exile for 70 years. That means removed off of their homeland. The land that, 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 that had so much fighting had taken place. That land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. The, that land of milk and honey. That land that was meant to be a representation of the promise and blessing of God. They had been off of that land for 70 years, scattered abroad. Just, just scattered abroad and, and trying to figure out what does godliness look like when I don't have proximity to God. The southern kingdom, the, the, the northern kingdom, there's division even within their own ranks. The temple was destroyed. The gates of the city were torn down. And then Nehemiah hears about it. And Nehemiah is inspired to get involved. He was so grieved that he was compelled to act. And I truly believe that when something stirs your heart, it should activate your hands. And so he begins this process of rebuilding what was once destroyed, rebuilding what the adversary had came to destroy. And now initially, people thought he was crazy. Nehemiah shows up, who literally is working in the king's palace, has favor with the king. The king allows him to take on this assignment. And when he shows up trying to rebuild this thing, he was met with so much opposition. In fact, I would say it this way. He had more opposition than he had support. Because people were like, man, like this is destroyed. It makes no sense for you even to try to build this thing back up. 
In fact, the text tells us about this man named Samballot. Samballot is like the number one antagonist of this narrative. From the very beginning, he's the one who's there, who's trying to like throw a little shade in the progress that Nehemiah is trying to make. Now, now Sam Ballot's name, it means this. It literally means sin that gives life. I don't know why his parents would name him that because he's living up to it at this point. Sin that gives life. So that means that he tried to create the type of opposition that would take upon a life of its own. Kind of like gossip and, and rumors and, and drama and confusion. And, and, and some of the tactics that Sam Ballot would use would be mocking. As, as Nehemiah is gathering these men around, he's sitting back and looking at them with his arms folded and mocking them. What are you, what are you guys doing? That's just so ridiculous. Why are you even trying to rebuild the city walls? Are you guys trying to cause a mutiny against the king? Like he began to, to mock them. Then it was criticism. You guys are not even doing a good job. If I was doing it, I would do it differently. He's, he's trying to criticize them. Then he brings confusion. He's, he brings in false prophets to tell them that God told them that they should stop. They, they're bringing in all these false letters from, from, these, from these other people saying that, you know, you need to stop the works. They're dealing with confusion. Then it's intimidation. He shows up with, with armies and soldiers trying to tell them that you need to cease and desist. They got threats. Then it was attacks on Nehemiah's character, telling them that he was exploiting the people. It was so much opposition. But in spite of this, Nehemiah had made up his mind. That in spite of all the resistance, in spite of the nonstop ridicule, in spite of the nonstop drama he was facing, he made up his mind. I want you to hear me right now. Never underestimate the power of a made up mind. Never, never underestimate that. You'd be surprised at how much progress you can make when you truly have a made up mind. I'm a firm believer that the, that the longest distance that we take is not one of proximity, but it's one of a decision. It's when we make up our mind. When I make up my mind that I'm not gonna move from this spot. When I make up my mind that I'm gonna see this thing to its end. I, when I make up my mind that I'm not gonna get a divorce. A made up mind is the most impactful person on the planet. You see, I, I think about the woman with the issue of blood. She made up in her mind that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, then I know that I'll be made whole. She made it up in her mind. I'm thinking about the prodigal son while he was living away from his father, living in squalor, but he made up in his mind. The Bible actually says that he came to himself and that means that he made up his mind and said, if I can just get back home to my father, I will, I will be better as a servant than to be out here in bondage. He just made up his mind. It reminds me of blind Bartimaeus because when he was calling on Jesus, the Bible says that the disciples actually said, you're making too much noise. You need to be quiet. But he made up his mind that, no, I know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I hear that Jesus is here and he made up his mind. I'm going to lift my voice even louder because I know my breakthrough was on the other side of my praise. I wish somebody could grab a hold of this. He made up his mind. I believe that a made up mind is the most powerful thing that we can have. But unfortunately, we live in a world of groupthink and consensus and social media and Googling for how we should feel about things. We have, we have to update our software. This is why Paul tells us in Romans 12 that we have to have the renewing of our mind. We have to have a different way that we approach this. Paul even tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter four, verse 14, he says, then we will no longer be like little children tossed by the waves, blown around by every form of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and techniques of deceit. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. What, what Paul is telling them is that you're going to have some people that will infiltrate your life that are going to try to throw things at you that will try to get you distracted and off mission on what I've asked you to do. James even talks about it where he says these words, and I've, I love it. A double minded person is unstable in all of his ways. Just unstable. Like you, 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 you lack stability. Do, do you see the picture here? Can you imagine the amount of injury that we waste when we are redeciding things that we should have already decided? We're, we're redeciding things that we've already should have decided. Let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you like this. So for me, I'm, I'm a, I have rhythms, I have ways that I do things. And so whenever me and my family are making a decision, we, we make a decision that we're gonna go somewhere. Like, hey, we're gonna all go out to dinner as a family. We're gonna leave tonight at 7 p.m. 
We're going to leave tonight at 7 p.m. We're leaving our home at 7 p.m. That is the decision. I, I want you to sign this document. We're all in agreement that we're leaving the house at 7 p.m. We are agreed on where we're going at 7 p.m. We're in agreement. We're in agreement. Okay, thank God we're in agreement. Then it never fails. It never fails, Hannah. It'll be like around 648. And then my son will say like, hey, what, what time are we leaving again? Father, in the name of Jesus, I, 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 we had a whole discussion on it. We took 20 minutes. I did a whole PowerPoint presentation on it. I told you what time we're leaving. Well, do you think we could leave at 715 because I'm in the middle of this of this game? Or, hey, what restaurant are we going to? Why are we talking about something that we already made a decision on? We already agreed on where we're going. We had a family meeting and we were all in agreement. Why are we talking about something that we already made a decision on? I hope you're tracking with me right now. Do you know how many people we spend our time redeciding things that we should have already decided? There are people that are redeciding whether or not they want to stay married every day. Imagine the energy that you're waiting on when you're sitting on the balls of your feet and all it takes is one mistake for you to be out. Uh, imagine that. Some people are trying to redecide what friends they're going to have in their life, and all they're doing is sitting on the balls of their feet, waiting for one little thing to offend them, and then they're out. Redeciding things that they already should have decided. There's so many of us that spend our energy redeciding things that we should have already decided. The children of Israel, they wandered in Egypt for 40 years because they couldn't make up their mind where they wanted to be. They constantly referred back to Egypt. Now, now let me remind you, in Exodus, they prayed for deliverance. In Exodus, they cried out and asked for God to bring them deliverance. For 400 years, they prayed this prayer. And then they're about three days out of this miracle, and they're saying, man, it was way better when we were back in Egypt. For the entire 40-year journey, they continue to reflect back from the very place they asked God to deliver them from. Why is our human condition to believe that what was in the past is better than what God has for us in our future. Why, why, why is it in our human condition to honestly believe that, that the thing that God delivered us from is the thing that is better for us? It's, it's amazing how we allow ourselves to cheat on the future because we romanticize the past. Man, it was so good in the good old days when we had these things. But I've come to this conclusion that if the good old days is what God wanted us to have, then that is what we would have. When God wants to do a new thing, we have to make up our mind to make a decision to move forward. See, a made up mind allows you to stand in the face of adversity and not allowing your feelings to make you shift from the place that God has called you to be. Per perhaps there's somebody that's watching this right now and, and, and some of this stuff is hitting home so close because you have been facing opposition. It could be this season, it could be this year, it, it could be this month, it could even be today. And as you're sitting here saying to yourself, I'm just facing so much opposition, I want you to be encouraged because you are in good company. I have not seen one kingdom initiative that didn't face opposition. I haven't seen one thing that was advancing the kingdom of God that didn't truly face opposition. Let me tell you about this young lady named Ruby Bridges. On November 14th in 1960, she, she went to school. She was the first African-American to ever go to an integrated school. From the time she showed up, there were adults outside yelling at her. There were, there were teachers outside yelling at her. She faced so much opposition. Every step she took was riddled with opposition. She had to literally be escorted by federal marshals. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, why would you even go through this? Why would you even endure this? But she and her family had made up their mind that in spite of the opposition, we know that this is bigger than us. We know that we're called to do something that could potentially break a pathway for someone else to walk in much smoother than we are. They made up their mind. I love the resiliency that I see. I have not seen a single person do anything for the kingdom that they did not face true opposition. Moses faced opposition. John the Baptist faced opposition. Jesus faced opposition. We are in good company. So if you're sitting home right now and you're thinking of all the opposition that you face and you're thinking that that's evidence that God is not with you, let me show you what the Bible says. It says that even though the enemy may be against you, but God is still for you. We all face moments of opposition, but when the God is calling you to do something, make up your mind to see it through. Nehemiah faced opposition the entire time, but he made up his mind and said that I'm going to stick to this thing. 
as Nehemiah finished this incredible project, he still recognized that his work wasn't finished. Uh, I want you to catch that, that even though he had finished the project, he recognized that his work wasn't finished. He, he understood that he needed to put some things in place in order to ensure that what he built up, the enemy couldn't later come back and destroy. Let me, let me say this to somebody right now. Don't let your progress lead you to complacency. Because sometimes we'll get, we'll get progress, we'll get comfortable, and then, and then we get really complacent. We feel like we've made it. We feel like we've arrived. So when we look at this text, when, when Nehemiah finishes building the wall, he begins to send out the beacon, letting folks know that it's safe for them to come home. He still puts some really critical things in place. And what I believe is not only as a church family are we moving forward, but I believe we as individuals are moving forward. And while we may face opposition, I want to encourage us with a couple of things that I think that we need to anchor into our souls as we're moving forward. Here's the first thing that I want us to write down. Stay on guard. Stay on guard. Please, please, please stay on guard. Stay on guard. Don't, don't put your guard down. You, if you ever watch boxing, they'll say, hey, protect yourself at all times. Even when the bell rings, don't put your hands down because that one punch could come in and be the thing that knocks you out. We got to stay on guard. Nehemiah, that even though they have now made it into this facility where, where they had everything in place, the, the walls were built up, the gates were put into place, but the Bible says that he put security guards there even though things seem to be safe. He had, to, he had to put some things in place. Like we all do things to try to protect what's ours, right? We have, we have phones that have facial recognition that protect our devices. We have pin numbers for our bank accounts. We have doorbell cameras that allow us to see when people are showing up. We, we do a lot of things to, to make sure that we're protecting what is ours. Why? Because we want to ensure that we have coverage before the enemy shows up. We want to ensure that, we're, that it's very clear that when the enemy shows up, that we're already covered. We even have alarm systems that we put into our homes, and then we'll put like the little sign out in the front yard saying like, hey, this house is protected. This house has coverage. It, it makes me wonder, though, if the enemy is creeping around our homes, can he see that our guards are up? Can he see that our homes are protected? Or is he, or is he going to notice that, man, like their guard is down? They, they really aren't as protected as it appears that they are. I believe that the adversary is looking for opportunities to exploit the moments where we let our guard down. But when we have things in place to protect us, it keeps the adversary from stealing our joy and stealing our peace. See, I, I remember when we had some housework done um, in our home um, several years ago. And while the work was being done, um, Megan had placed her ring on the kitchen counter. Placed her ring on the kitchen counter. And I'm in the room, and she calls me, and she says, Keith, come here. I go in the room, and she's like, my ring is missing. Now, you, you, here's what you got to know about my wife. It's, she'll, she'll, she'll jump to the dramatic side quick. So I'm thinking, like, hey, you probably put it somewhere. You didn't know where. She's like, no, I know where I put it. I'm like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, I know I put it on the countertop, and my ring is missing, and I'm about to go up there, and I'm about to turn it out. I'm like, calm down. Let, let, me, let me look around before we overreact. So we look all around, and then so now I'm like, man, like these guys are here, they're just doing their job, they're working hard. They, of all the different clients they have, they don't need this take from me, you know? So I'm thinking like, there's no way. So I go out to the, 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 the boss, I'm like, hey man, um, did you guys happen to see a, a, a ring out here? My, my wife said she couldn't find a ring. And immediately, the reaction was like, no, we didn't see a ring, like, I, I didn't like the way they responded, and I was like, okay, like that? That seemed, a little, that seemed a little shady. I said, so, so now I'm getting a little, I'm like, man, so you didn't see a ring? He's like, no, I didn't see a ring. So Megan's like, you ain't see my ring? I'm like, hey, calm down, I got this. Like, you ain't see my, I'm like, just, I got, relax. I said, so you didn't see the ring? They like, nope, we didn't see the ring. So now it's like a standoff. So I said, hey, um, do me a favor. Can you look right there? There's a camera right there. I'm gonna go back into my room and I'm gonna pull up the footage of what's happened in my house and I'm gonna know exactly whether or not you guys have seen my wife's ring. I walked out of the room. Three seconds later, it's a miracle. They found the ring. Hey, we, we, we found it. We found it sitting right here on the floor, sir. Um, it, we, we didn't take it. It fell off into a box, but we found it right here. I went back and looked at the footage, and they had their back to it, so I couldn't tell. But I'm confident. I'm confident that if we didn't have something in place that allowed me to see what was happening, that we could have possibly lost something that had significant value. Let, let, me, let me speak plain to somebody right now. Our prayer life is the way that we are able to keep our guards up. 
And then I think that unfortunately, what can happen is when we get the thing that we've been praying for, we stop praying about it. But when you live a life where you're on guard and you keep your head on a swivel and you're making sure that your discernment is strong is when you have an effective prayer life. When we have our prayer life in place, it ensures that even if the enemy shows up, we can discern his presence and we can recognize what he is trying to do. The, the other thing that, that Nehemiah does is not only does he have some guards that are in place who are making sure that the enemy doesn't have access, but he also prioritizes worship. What the scripture actually says is that he puts singers in place. Now, I always think that that's interesting that of all the different things that Nehemiah could have put into place, he put he put a choir in place. Now, he knows that he's going to be dealing with opposition. He 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 knows that that there could potentially be soldiers that show up, but he has a couple of security guards, but he decides to put a bunch of worshipers out there. You see, I'm a person that loves all types of music. And I got a playlist for everything, Ant. I, I, I even got a playlist for payday. It's, it's, I, got a, I, got a, I got a payday playlist. I got a, I got a gym playlist. I haven't really been playing that one that much. Um, I, got, I, got, I got a bunch of different playlists. However, there is something different about worship. Nehemiah understood the importance of worship. You see, he would have been familiar with the statement, sin, Judah first. In many instances, when the children of Israel would go off into war, when they would go off into battle, it wasn't a matter of them having the appropriate amount of skills. In many cases, they didn't. But what the Bible says is that they would sin Judah first. They would start off a battle with praise and it would bring confusion to the enemy. Here's what I want you to understand. The enemy will be confused when you know how to praise God when everything is against you. The enemy will be confused when you know how to have optimism even when you're facing opposition. The enemy will be confused when you know how to give God praise when you just lost your job. See, it, it brings confusion to the adversary and what, what Nehemiah understood is that if I can have praise around me at all times, that even if I face opposition, it's gonna usher in the presence of God. See, Nehemiah would have understood that it was when the worshipers had marched around the walls of Jericho that it was the lifting of their voices that brought the walls down. They would have understood with the story of Gideon and his 300 of how he was able to make sure that they lifted up their voices for worship and they were able to bring victory to the children of Israel. Nehemiah understood the importance of making sure you prioritize worship. The question is, what is on your playlist right now? Many times we have so many different things that we're listening to. We're listening to the opinions of man. We're, we're listening to our feelings. We're, we're listening to what a Google search says. We're, we're listening to everybody else, but we don't have a worship playlist so that when the adversary shows up, we're ushering in the presence of God. See, sometimes you just got to go back a little old school and have a little bit of Fred Hammond that's in your playlist right now. A little bit of no weapon that is formed against me that shall prosper. And every now and then you need to have a, a little bit of Yolanda Adams where she sings out that the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. You may even have to go a little bit of Marvin Sapp where you say, I never would have made it without you. I don't want to leave out some of my other friends out there. So you every now and then you might need to play a little bit of Oceans to make sure that you understand that the Spirit of God is leading you. Every now and then, what's hot on my playlist right now is Jira. Because I know that God is more than enough. What I'm saying is, when you find yourself facing opposition, what is your worship playlist that you can go to? Many times we're trying to find something. We're trying to fumble through it. But if you don't have a battle playlist already set up, if you don't have something that you can already go to so that when the enemy shows up like a flood, that the Spirit of God can lift up a standard against it. I want to encourage you, friends, that even as you move forward, even as you experience success, even as you begin to take ground, don't you dare stop prioritizing work. Worship, because worship will usher in the presence of God, the presence of God. It's a powerful thing. The third and final thing I want us to make sure that we're doing as we're moving forward, as we're taking ground, as we as we welcome ourselves back home is we have to make room. We have to make room. There's there's a lot of nuances in the text where it begins to talk about how there was a lot of open space. Re remember, this was the promised land. And, and if, we, if we remember from when the children of Israel finally got into the promised land and Joshua and Caleb began to distribute the land, that land was given to all of the offsprings. It was all set up. So that land was still there. So what the text says is that it was a lot of open spaces, but all the people weren't back yet. There was a few people that were back, but the masses hadn't come back yet. Now, I can imagine that if you were a part of the few that were there, you could have been very resistant 
of having new people show up. Because I got all this big land, I could build the biggest house on the block, it can be all mine. But they understood that there was strength in the family. They understood the importance of community. So what, what Nehemiah began to do is he began to gather the people and distribute their land back to the things that had already been given to them. In other words, they had to make sure that they made room for what God was going to send. I, I often ask myself, if God wanted to send a miracle right now, do I have room for it? That, that if God wanted to do a new thing in my life right now, do I have the margin for it? That, that if God wanted to shift everything right now, have I made room for God to move? See, this passage is a beautiful illustration of how Nehemiah had, had built this environment to allow the people of God who had been scattered to come back home so that we can make room for them to once again occupy the land that God had promised to them. See, I love what it says here in Nehemiah 7, verse 3. It says, do not open the gates of Jerusalem until the sun is hot. That means until daylight. Let the doors be shut securely and fastened while the guards are on duty. What Nehemiah is ultimately saying is, we got to make sure we keep our guard up. We, we got to make sure that we are in position in case the enemy shows up. But when the daytime is up, we're going to open the doors up to make sure that people know that they're welcome to come back in. Because we can make a distinction between the ones that God is sending and the ones who mean us harm. Nehemiah understood that even though we're fortified, even though we're prayerful, even though we have worship, even though we're ready for the enemy, we want to make sure that the door is open so that everybody that God is sending to come back home has a place for them to occupy. You see, I had the incredible honor and privilege of officiating a wedding just a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and again, one of my favorite things is just to see how families come together. And, and there was this moment where the mother of the groom stood up. It was at the rehearsal dinner. And there's the bride's family, the groom's family, there's friends, everybody's there and, and everybody's excited and people are meeting for the first time. And, you know, these COVID weddings are, are very unique because you're finding people who are meeting for the first time during the wedding. It's, it's, it's really powerful. But, but the mom got up and she gave this powerful speech about how they've been scattered. They've been away from one another. But it felt so good to have family come back home. She said, it feels like a family reunion and there's so many people that I haven't even met before. I pray that you feel welcome, welcome home. I don't know why that struck me so much. I've, I've seen hundreds of those speeches, but that time knowing that the people were scattered and they, they positioned themselves to all come, the family made room for people they didn't know, but they were immediately family because we were all occupying the same space at the same time. And she said these words, welcome home. I believe that is exactly the message that God has for all of us right now. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't even matter how you got here. Welcome home. And as our church is moving forward and wherever you may find yourself, maybe God is stirring you to say, it's time for you to come back home. The thing that I love about the kingdom of God is that God is always making space for us if we're willing to make space for him. And, and maybe you're watching us right now and, and maybe you're away from God. I want to let you know you're welcome to come back home. Maybe you've been scattered and, and, and maybe you've been struggling and trying to figure things out. Maybe you've been facing opposition and, and this season has been one that has presented so many deep challenges. Just come back home with the family. Allow the people of God and the presence of God to give you the strength that you need. I know you may have faced some opposition. You're in good company. I've never seen anyone or anything that is kingdom minded not face opposition. You're in good company. You have a family that's with you. The presence of God is with you. And if God be for you, what can stand against you? So if that's you and you know your next step is to simply say yes to God, is to accept the invitation and to come home, I want to pray for you. In a moment, we're going to have some instructions that will come up and, and give you some clear next steps on what that can look like for you. But I don't want this moment to pass you by. Regardless of where you've been and how you got here, I want to let you know that there is a place for you. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for your presence. And I thank you for our friends who are watching online right now, our friends who may have been scattered, our friends who may be away from you, Lord. And I'm grateful that for such a time as this, that you have built up an environment that will allow them to come back home and they can benefit from the investments in the seeds that have been planted by those who've come before them. 
God, I pray for those who are saying yes to you, possibly for the very first time. I pray that you begin to stir their hearts, that you allow them to get connected to a Bible-believing church, Father, a Bible-believing community, Lord, that's going to help to develop them and cultivate them into what their next steps are going to be. I pray that you fill them with your spirit, and I pray that you order their steps in Jesus' name. And now, God, I pray for every one of us that have been dealing with opposition in this season, all the challenges, all the ridicule, all the frustration, all the pain. I I pray that we recognize, God, that you are with us, that your power is with us, your grace is with us, that your strength is with us. And Father, we're going to position ourselves to be people that keep our guard up. We're going to pray as we move forward. We're going to worship as we move forward, but we're also going to make room for what you want to do in this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. Love you so much. I cannot wait to worship with you next week. We are so glad that you joined us this morning for church. Remember, every Sunday, starting at 8 a.m., we have virtual prayer together. It's a great time to come together with our church community before services to prepare our hearts and minds to come together as a family and to worship Him, to pray over each other and to pray over the community around us. So be sure to join us for virtual prayer next week at 8 a.m. Church, I hope you have a great week and we can't wait to see you next week.